Welcome everyone to today's Mara guest lecture. Dr. Lisa Dalby uh, is an information governance professional with the Royal Bank of Canada. Lisa holds a doctorate, PhD, in information technology and is a certified records manager and a certified information governance professional. Lisa is also, as most of you know, a lecturer at the School of Information, San Jose State University, in both the Master of Archives and Records Administration and the Master of Library and Information Science program. Lisa teaches on a variety of subjects, which include emerging technology trends and their effect on information management and governance, and today she's going to speak to us about the compliance issues with the EU's new GDPR uh, regulations. So, Lisa, I'll turn it over to you. Hello, everyone, and thank you, Pat, for that lovely uh, introduction and this kind invitation to speak. So, as the title of my presentation indicates, I'm here to have a very high-level conversation about the European Union, the EU, general data protection regulation, effectively known as GDPR. And what I'm going to talk to you about today is very much from the perspective of an information management professional, a records management professional. GDPR is really a very complex legislation with, you know, very gray areas in some areas. And I am really here just to share my story as an information governance professional and a records manager who worked on a large GDPR project uh, for a large organization who operates in the European Union starting in around 2017 and really continuing up until today and beyond. So welcome everyone and we're really going to be talking about GDPR and really a path towards records and information management compliance. So as way of uh, agenda for today, I thought we'd begin with just a high-level overview of what the EU General Data Protection Regulation is, with a flavor of me interjecting my perspective from an organizational kind of case study focus. Then I want to talk about what is really uh, most important to uh, records managers and information management uh, professionals is the concept of data subject rights under GDPR and probably one of the most talked about uh, subject rights in GDPR is this whole concept of the right to erasure by, by clients or customers or people also known you know, in the general media as the right to be forgotten. And it is probably, again, uh, what we'll, we will be focusing on the, the most uh, today. And because, uh, you know, the new California Consumer Privacy Act uh, is getting a lot of attention in the media, and uh, I thought I would kind of take some time to draw comparisons between GDPR and the new California reg, and then we really do as information managers and records managers needs to understand the exemptions that apply to us under the right to erasure or the right to be forgotten or the right to deletion. And then as we close out today's discussion, I will talk about, you know, under GDPR beyond sort of these data subject rights, additional information management or records management responsibilities that came about because of the rec because of the new regulation. And then I will close out with uh, always talking about the importance of information governance programs and records management programs. And really, you can only succeed in this space uh, by moving forward with an information governance or records and information management program at the very least in this space. So Complying with uh, GDPR for an organization is really, uh, from my perspective, it was really a massive undertaking for an organization. And it, it took, uh, again, a, a large compliance program 
with a senior executive oversight, with a number of working committees, and really dividing uh, these various working committees into various work streams. And I uh, managed to chair uh, uh, the data retention and destruction work stream within uh, the GDPR project, which is very specific, but it was very relevant to records and information management. And really, I'm just here to share my experiences with you, given that uh, uh, it is really a unique experience uh, working on a GDPR project for a multinational organization. Um, the organization is a, a major bank, uh, and it provides commercial banking, wealth management, insurance. It has you know, 84,000 employees, 16 million clients operating in 33 countries. So it really is a great case study to look at. And the organization... It, it, is considered under GDPR a controller. It controls information and it also a processor. It, it processes information on, on the behalf of other organization. And obviously an organization this size will have personally identifiable information or personal data. And that's the key focus of GDPR is personal data. And GDPR defines personal data as any information which are related to an identified or identified natural person. And so that's really broadly interpreted. So, you know, identifiable information is your name, your, you know, your ID numbers, your account numbers, your customer numbers, your, or any combination of those. But what is, what is, what is important about that definition is also the concept of natural person. So it really just means people. So that excludes legal entities, corporation, foundations, or institutions, which is an important concept. So we're really just talking about people. And the regulation is really talks again about from birth to death. So it's all, encomp it's all encompassing. It's for the life of the natural person. GDPR also talks a little bit about sensitive data, which it describes as biometrics, health data, you know, your race, your ethnic, your, sec your sexual or orientation, your religion. So there's also uh, a sub-definition of personal data, then they talk about personal data. But I really did want to stress that as records and information professionals and as, you know, information governance professionals, we really care about all data. So when we talk about GDPR, which is very kind of specific to kind of personal information or sensitive data, we have to always keep in mind that we, we as information professionals care about all data, not just what is personal or sensitive as defined under GDPR. So uh, I'm going to begin by really talking about, so the European uh, took, the GDPR took effect on May 25th, uh, 2018. So it's, it's been past a year. So it's really interesting to reflect on what the last year looks like in terms of uh, GDPR compliance. And so the reg was really just designed to protect the privacy rights and freedoms of individuals residing in the EU. And we really only have to look at, you know, media weekly uh, and read about it uh, to see, you know, you know, breaches in the media and scandals. If we have some time at the end, you know, we can talk a little bit about Equifax. That's probably one of the biggest ones I've seen recently. So we really do need to understand that this is a reality that breaches and, and our privacy of information is really a serious concern. And so, and given that GDPR is concerned with the processing of EU residents' personal data, regardless of uh, where the information is stored, the reg is really affecting organizations globally. Uh, and so G GDPR is really a comprehensive regulation with provisions that talk about client consent, data breaches, data processing, security, and individual subject rights. And so individual subject rights is what we're gonna be really focusing on today because that really is, is one of the, the key things that we should understand as uh, records managers and information professionals. So what is really interesting about GDPR and why it is receiving so much attention outside of the EU, it is really, because it's expected to kind of set the standard for all privacy regulations globally to follow. And I'm closely 
tracking New Zealand, Chile, India. Canada is making some changes to their uh, privacy regulations. So it's really interesting just to see how this reg is affecting other national uh, privacy regulations across the globe. But what is really scary about GDPR is that the EU uh, supervisory, supervisory authorities, or what we know as regulators, can fine organizations 20 million euros or 4% of the annual global revenue for violations. So again, that's why this is getting so much uh, attention because those uh, fines for organizations can be quite substantial. So individual subject rights, and this is where we'll start. So under GDPR, subjects, who are people, uh, have a number of rights. And my goal really is to share with you what these rights mean from an information management, records management perspective. So under GPR, there's basically eight high level rights that individuals have with regards to their data. So individuals have the right to be informed and that really means that they have the right to know what data and information you have on them uh, that is being stored or processed. Under GDPR, people and subjects have the right to access, so they really have the right to contact an organization that has uh, their data and, and say, hey, please give me access or view or please provide copies of kind of the data you have on me. They also have the right to rectification. This is really interesting because if they see if they see something in their data or their records that is not accurate, uh, data subjects have the right to request that you change the data and make it accurate. So if they see an error, they have the right to request a change to their data. They also have the right to erasure, which is what we're going to be talking about today in a little detail, which really is what we'll be calling sort of the right to be forgotten. And it's provision number 17 under GDPR. And again, uh, this, is, this is really an interesting, you know, the right to ask for information to de be deleted about them. They also have the right to re restrict processing. And so a lot of uh, organizations process uh, data automatically. Uh, and they just need data points and, and, and you know, decisions get made automatically through workflow solutions. So under GDPR, an individual has the right to, to restrict that sort of auto processing of data which is interesting because sometimes auto processing of data can issue results that are not favorable. So interesting that uh, they have the right to, uh, to investigate this kind of auto processing of data. They also have the right to data portability, which is the really the right to transfer their personal data to another organization if they move or, or, or any other uh, third party. And they also have the right to object and withdraw consent. So that's interesting because as part of GDPR, individuals are generally consenting and signing consent agreements. But at any given time, they can withdraw that for a certain period of time or withdraw it permanently. So under GDPR, these are just the rights of individuals. So as, as records people and information professionals, it's just important that we have an understanding of these, these rights. So I thought I'd just take those high level rights that we just talked about and do a quick comparison to what the new California consumer privacy rights uh, I'm sorry, privacy regs uh, draft ha is saying in this domain. So as, as many of you know, <coughs> California in June of uh, 2018 signed in the new law uh, of, of re regarding uh, client, pri uh, client and people privacy. Um, the new law is, is, is scheduled to take place in 2020. Um, and it really is the reason why it's getting so much attention because it really is one of the first state laws in the U.S. Uh, to, to pass something very GDPR-like in terms of protecting client privacy. Uh, and it's, I just thought it would be really just an interesting comparison. There's a lot of states that have got kind of draft legislation to follow. I think I saw, you know, uh, Vermont, Colorado. So it's going to be really interesting to see this space in terms, in terms of 
state uh, publishing uh, and, and enacting privacy legislation. So at a very high level, there's very a lot of similarities between the two. And there's a, there's a few things that are a little different. So I just at a very high level want to chat about just, just a few. So the right to be informed and the right to access your data and the right to port that data out, outside of your organization is covered in the California reg under the concept of the right to disclosure, which is, you know, you have the right to request, collect, and, and, and understand what organizations have on you. Interesting, under the California reg, they also have the concept of the right to erasure. They call it the right to deletion, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. They have the right to, to request the deletion of data as well. And if you look at the bottom of this slide, they also have the right to opt out, uh, which is very comparable to the EU reg of the right to object or withdraw consent. Consumers have the right to request that uh, information not be, be sold or you know, restrictions on the sale of PII, personally identifiable information. So you can see how there are very much similarities Interesting, uh, under the California reg, they don't have the right to like change data or the right to, to correct data if it's not accurate. And they don't have that very specific right of, you know, if, if something is being manually or automatically processed to change that, which I thought was interesting. But what they do have that is un what the EU doesn't have, which I thought was really kind of interesting is, of course, California has as has a, a right to do not discriminate um, against clients or customers uh, if they do exercise any of these consumer rights. So that was an interesting disclosure in the new California reg is that, you know, if I am access, exercising the right to opt out or disclose or delete, you do not discriminate, discriminate against, against me, which is, which is, which is uh, interesting. So when I first heard about this kind of right to erasure as a records manager, I was like, what? I was <laughs> a little bit panicking, to be honest. I'm like, who are the EU to come and say what can be deleted and what can't be deleted? Um, and so, you know, that that's kind of a very natural first reaction when you hear about the right to be forgotten and the right to erasure. But um, I'm here to say that that right to erasure is not an absolute right, and it has several exemptions, three of which really affected me in the private sector. Um, but I've listed six here, and but the three that really affected me in the private sector, the ones with the little stars next to them, but I will focus in on them um, mostly. So the right to erasure is Article 17 and and uh, so but these are the exemptions. So this is at, yeah, absolutely uh, an, an, a client or a customer has the right to be forgotten but not if there's a legal obligation to retain that personal data and what I mean there's often competing uh, legislation or regulations to ret to retain data and and from my perspective this often is you know bank act regulations anti-money laundering regulations tax acts these competing regulations that say hey you must retain data for x amount of years so these are the traditional kind of record keeping regulations that we're most uh, we're most familiar with that pretty much form the basis of our retention schedules. So if your retention schedule says, hey, we have a legal obligation to retain this personal uh, information, then you have a right to keep that, that data regardless of this right to erasure. There's also the concept of being allowed to keep data to carry out your contractual obligations. So personal data is often required to to process or service or do the job uh, that you interact with your clients. So if you're a financial organization, you often requ are required to have personal, to keep personal benefit applicable information so that you can offer those banking services or products or loans and mortgages and credit cards and all investments, all of those wonderful things that you engage with an organization to do you have the right 
to keep that data in order to, you know, do your job and, and process and, and service your clients. So uh, that's another, you know, obligation and that's another exemption under, uh, under GDPR for the right to be forgotten. The third, uh, it, the third uh, item is to establish or exercise or defend of a legal, legal claim. And so what this means is that you, you're, you're, you're required or have the right to retain personally identifiable information on a, on a subject or a consumer if there's sort of like a legal hold, there's some lawsuit or court order or class ash action, or you're protecting yourself and against an investigation or a third party demand request. So if there's sort of some case going on and you need that, that data to defend yourself or defend one of your clients, then there's that exemption to retain that data. And again, more importantly, but more sort of in the private sector, you have the right to retain data for freedom of information and expression, which we could have a whole other lecture on, on the balancing, you know, freedom of information and privacy. If the data is interest of public health, you also have the right to retain that data. And also if the data is going to help, you know, generally for scientific, uh, historical research or statistical purposes. So the right to erasure is a right of, of individuals, but there's also these important exemptions which allow an organization to retain that data for these purposes. So really, quite bluntly, uh, the need to retain your data really is for as long as you're, you know, servicing your client or your consumer. Uh, so it would be like the relationship. Uh, so it, it, it really, it really just focuses GDPR really as a records and information manager professional. It really just focuses you to really think about data retention and destruction. I also get a really questioned in this space around the concept of deleting data when it should be deleted and not over retaining data and the concept of encrypting or anonymizing. So under GDPR, if you uh, want to retain data potentially for long-term trending or analysis or for any sort of research purposes, uh, the concept of encrypting or anonymizing, like irreversibly taking personally identifiable personal information and masking it in some way uh, so that is not viewed in any way and cannot be reversed. That is also a concept. Uh, I like to say that that's like plan B. We really do want to delete data when, it, when, it's, when it's up for destruction, but if you need sort of aggregation of data for sort of long-term trending analysis, it is acceptable to sort of anonymize all that personally identifiable and sensitive data and keep your data set for long-term trending and analysis as long as all of that personally identifiable information is anonymized, masked, and uh, encrypted in any way. So again, I thought I would do a really interesting comparison between GDPR and California in terms of what they think of consumer rights in this space uh, around deletion. And again, very similar, uh, which is very interesting. Um, and then there's a couple nuances. So, you know, uh, California is exactly shares the same concept that, you know, consumers have the, the right to exercise free speech and ensure the rights that of other consumers to exercise his or her rights in terms of freedom of information. So there's a, a real one-to-one -one relationship there. Um, California also says that they need to uh, have exemptions if the data is required for some sort of legal obligation. So again, like a one-to-one -one relationship there. Again, uh, California says that, you know, there's a need to retain data if the, if it's the data is needed to, to transact uh, and provide goods and services requested by the consumer. There's not that public health uh, correlation. And interestingly, uh, California doesn't have that public health 
uh, exemption. So that could change since uh, P uh, the California is still kind of in draft format, but it'll be interesting to track that public health uh, item. And again, uh, California, again, has one-to-one -one relationship that if, if information is required for peer review or, or, you know, scientific, historic, or, you know, statistical purposes, that it also can be retained. And it, it really has, a, a event, again, a very one-to-one -one relationship about keeping data if it needs to detect security in incidents, protect against, you know, fraudulent or illegal activity. So sort of that the legal defense uh, construct or prosecute those responsibility, the responsible for illegal activity. So again, it's just really interesting to see how the EU is influencing, potentially influencing kind of uh, the California reg. So I'm going to stop there because I'm going to switch gears a little bit and talk about some other evidentiary information management responsibilities that we need to think about as records and information managers. If any I, questions. I do see two questions in the chat area. One is from uh, Jean, how will the use of AI impact companies with the GDPR? So artificial intelligence. That's a great question, um, and I think it will greatly impact organizations. Um, I know not only artificial intelligence, but there's t other tools with artificial intelligence capabilities that have um, the capability to scan environments, whether they be structured environments or unstructured environments, and I'll just briefly talk a little bit about that. Structured environments are like those data warehouses and data lakes and those data environments versus unstructured environments, which are like SharePoints and share drives and, you know, files, uh, both physical and non, you know, mostly electronic records. So there's tools that can search those environments. And I'll name a few of them if you're interested uh, that I've looked at that search those environments and have the capability to using AI and machine learning and just their own sophisticated uh, tooling to search these environments and pull up personally identifiable information, pull up stale data, how you define stale data. So absolutely, there's absolutely tooling in this space which will help you identify uh, data stores that have personally identifiable information and also will help you identify uh, stale data. So they're called kind of discovery tools. Um, stealth audit is one, uh, information analyzer is another, store IQ, uh, active navigation. So there's these tools in this space which absolutely help organizations identify their personally identifiable or sensitive data in these various uh, storage, wherever they store the, wherever they storage, wherever they store that environment in their environments. So what those tools do, will will do discovery. So we'll tell you that, hey, you've got stale data or personally identifiable information. And they actually, depending on how you install the tools, will take you to the next step and say, hey, how do you want to action th this data that we found in these environments? And there's generally three ways to action these in th this data that they found. They actually can go in and delete the data. They can quarantine it, which means like move it to a space where people can access it and you know then deal with it. Or they can actually transfer it and move it to like a content manager tool or SharePoint tool or some electronic records management tool where the data should be residing uh, instead of like in sort of non-controlled environments. So it's really, and they also have really, these tools have sophisticated kind of reporting, reporting to, to elements to it. So you can report on the types of information you're finding. And I find that to be the most powerful when you do say a scan of a sh you know, share points or share drives and you say, hey, look, in this environment, I've found you know, X amount of numbers of personally identifiable information. And I think when you have those metrics, 
it really gives you credibility and good good data to go to senior people within your organization and say, hey, we need to fund a project or this is this is the scope of the issue that we have here. So yeah, these, there's lots of great tools and that can help in this space. And a lot of them are driven by artificial intelligence and you know, machine learning. So great question. We have a second question too uh, from Carl. Would a potential Brexit retroactively remove the rights of British citizens to GDPR protection? And would this have significant economic effects for British organizations who utilize personal data? <laughs> wow, great question. Um, I have, I've had that question before, and uh, it's really interesting, like what's going to happen post-Brexit? And so what, what the industry is saying in for generally with most EU regs uh, is that when Britain exits, they will not, in this space, in this space, specifically in privacy, they will not adopt anything lower than what GDPR has already prescribed. So they're not going to exit and then, you know, have no privacy reg. They're going to exit and have the, the, a very similar privacy reg. They'll probably keep 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 this keep the flavor, um, because I think that's what is known. Uh, but that is only high level what the industry is saying. It, your question is great. Uh, I've I've tracked just a little bit of it on uh, what the what what blogs are saying. Uh, but the the general sense is that they won't go backward. They might, you know, when the, when the time comes, in, you know, implement something a little stronger. Uh, but the, the general feeling is that, you know, this GDPR has set a, set a kind of a gold standard and they, they won't come backwards. So it's still very early uh, in this space. And that's why it's a really interesting question. And it's something that we will need to monitor, especially if you're an organization that operates in the UK and many uh, North American uh, organizations do so it's just going to be interesting to see how that the whole exit strategy happens and what regs they will adopt generally beyond this from the EU and what they want but we know that they won't generally in this space privacy take a step backwards I hope that answers the question you said thank you and that's all for the questions right now I uh, agree um, so again, at a very high level, um, with the GDPR uh, reg, not only did we really need to worry about the data subject request that we were going to get and these right to erasure questions we were going to get, effects of the legislation, and again, it's a very comprehensive legislation with like 100 provisions, and I've really only focused on one, which is provision 17. Um, but the other provisions of the reg were by way of implementing those provisions, creating records and creating data. Um, some of the data was already being created by the organization and some of the data was, was new. So again, as a, you know, with new processes and uh, we just need to understand that you know, when a new regulation comes in, not only do we have to understand the, the regs, how it in, influence, influences us as records managers, even when it's influencing another part of the organization, those other parts of the organizations are creating records. So I just wanted to quickly talk about, you know, three big areas where I saw differences in just record keeping responsibilities and has, as information managers and, and records managers, we should un need to understand that new records and new data was being created. So did we need to update our policies and procedures? Did we need to uh, update our retention schedules because these new kind of classes of data was coming in and being created as part of GDPR? Um, and the answer to that is yes. So uh, part of the GDPR requires that, you know, uh, we do impact privacy impact assessments on certain data sets and that we map inventories and workflows. And so 
again, these were new types of data that was being created. So we had to think about ways of how we were going to manage uh, these privacy impact assessments that we were creating. Another massive part of GDPR was and consents to, you know, how we manage their data and their preferences on how we wanted their data to be managed and, you know, how they wanted to be contacted and all of these data requests that were coming in. So, again, we had to think about new and inventive ways on how to manage, you know, tracking what client consented to what and, and, and their preferences and then managing all those requests for subject for, for subject rights um, as, as well. And we can't forget that although we, you know, our vendors, the vendors that uh, work on behalf of our organizations, the supplier who, the suppliers who manage data on our behalf, they are also subject to the right, to, to the, the rights under GDPR, they're called processors. And so we had to make sure that, you know, we're performing risk assessments on our suppliers. And then, you know, if we're making adjustments to contracts because of GDPR that we're managing the contracts right and we're managing these risk assessments and managing our vendors in that space as well. And thankfully, hopefully this never happens, but if an incident did happen, uh, under GDPR you have uh, a legal obligation to notify your, uh, your clients and report on incidents and, uh, and assess the incidents. So thankfully this ha hasn't happened, but if it did, you would, again, there's this whole record keeping requirements around tracking the incidents, tracking if breaches happens, who the breach happens to, uh, and, and how you manage and worked through the incidents. So it's just really interesting from sort of an evidentiary perspective as information managers, when a new regulation comes along, sometimes it creates new record keeping responsibilities for you. And so that's all I kind of wanted to communicate on this slide. So obviously, uh, you know, and, and this is a, a plug for the, for, for the program and, and for those all interested in records governance and records and information management, None of this compliance for GDPR would have been possible without an organization having an overarching information governance, information management program. You know, GDPR really is just elevated the level of care and accountability, especially in the area of retention and disposition of data. And, you know, so none of what could be accomplished, can be accomplished without an overarching data retention uh, information governance program. And, and so you'll see this slide here. And, you know, data and, and, and records, you know, there's pet, most organizations have petabytes of data that can be, as I mentioned, with third party suppliers. It could be on shared drives and personal drives. It could be as much as like we like to think that we are very much a, a modern electronic organization. Data still exists in physical boxes, you know, in storage in with stored vendors. There's data on social media and on our websites. There's lots of data in our applications and the data lakes and the data warehouse and SharePoint sites and everything. So there really is a risk um, around data retention and destruction from a D GDPR perspective if you're not effectively managing uh, the data and as much as uh, I will always plug the ARMA uh, general, uh, general record keeping principles, but the ones I like to focus, I know there's eight, but the ones I like to focus on the most are the ones around, you know, retention and making sure that, or, you know, we as an organization shall, you know, maintain records for the right time period. And then we also have to be mindful of deleting data when it's no longer required. 
and the, and the concept of accountability that all employees uh, should be accountable and have data retention and destruction requirements it, it, it first in mind, and that we really compliance is a, is, a, is another big one, and that you know our organizations and partners shall comply with these you know record keeping laws and responsibilities. So I know that's a big landscape uh, and a big ask, but at a very high level, um, we you know. A, a, you know, GDPR is, you know, important regulation and you can only really comply with it if you have, you know, it, it makes compliance much easier if you have an overarching information governance program. And, you know, and what I mean by that is just having, you know, that legal structure at the very top of our little slide we see here and having policies and procedures around data retention and destruction and, being able to educate and train and provide advisory services and the and and the data literacy and education and training and and publicizing the importance of GDPR within your organization, and everything is is based on a risk management perspective in terms of sometimes you will have to make risk based decisions. Uh, do you put blanket retentions on certain data, knowing that? You know, some data will be retained longer than required. And so there's a whole element to risk management when you're looking at uh, an overarching program. And you will never do any of this alone. So uh, as part of an overarching information governance program, of course, you will have, you know, committees uh, as, as I, was, uh, I was part of and, and have stakeholders. And so that concept of not doing this alone is very much important. And then... Uh, you know, communicating and reporting and doing metrics and dashboarding. You know, I saw the probably the best uh, forward moving uh, movement of the information governance program by just reporting on some numbers that were not maybe positive and and then getting the appropriate funding and resources because the funding because the numbers were not you know positive. So. Uh, having those metrics and not just speaking anecdotally is really important in having, you know, trending and analysis. And then also using those metrics to report on your success is also important. And if I said, you know, if I make information governance and having an information governance program to help GDPR sound easy, it's not. Uh, it requires change management and also issue management there's many times where you're going to come across systems that aren't doing the right thing and you're going to say, hey, I've identified this issue. We, but the, what is important is you track the issue, you identify the issue, you document the issue, and then you issue management. Issue manage it, and then you say, hey, you know, you've got, you know, this amount of months to get into compliance. But, you know, you can't, you have to document that and, and uh, treat, have a whole, whole issue management program. Uh, associated with your IG program because not everyone is going to be uh, be able to be in compliant naturally uh, on day one and so and then you heard me speak about overarching all of this information governance program are a whole host of technology tools that you can use you heard me talk about the scanning tools there's electronic records management tools there's email vaulting tools there's e-discovery tools there's a many tools that can help in this space. So technology, while uh, it's very important, doesn't drive your IG program, but it just supports it more holistically. And you think, you know, you've heard me say this uh, previously, that you're not going to be able to do <laughs> this alone. You're going to need your colleagues from maybe your privacy team, those teams that manage uh, third parties, your privacy, your cybersecurity, information security teams. So again, just this overarching program is not, is, is, is what is generally required in order to deal with um, new regulations like GDPR that come, come around. And I think it's important to know if you have an established IG program, uh, you're generally more, you're not reacting, you're more, to, to a reg when it comes and you're scrambling, uh, having an IG program makes you more proactive. And when a new reg comes along, and they will, they're, 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 it's trending that way, uh, having this overarching program will just help you be more proactive as opposed to reactive. 
So I'm drawing just closer to the end of my presentation, uh, and I know we have a couple, maybe 10 minutes for questions, but just, you know, we've seen privacy in the media. The biggest one I've seen quite re recently is, you know, the Equifax breach that, you know, number of client data information was released from 2017. Uh, I think it was 143 million clients data was, was released so this this the need for gdpr is, is real and what 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 is interesting about the equifax fines that came down as a result of that breach was i've never quite seen this is that while information security was number one on the list number two on the list was uh, the data retention requirements and that's why this is also important uh, equifax had an established data retention policy uh, but the fact that it did not uh, comply with their data retention policy and and, ha and had over-retained data, and it was that over-retention of data that got breached, was number two on the list. So uh, I just wanted to call that out as, as just in, in terms of trending uh, in what we're seeing, that these fines can happen and breaches do happen. And so that's why, you know, being aware of the regulations and then being aware of information you know, how to kind of be proactive in managing your data with an information governance program is very important. So with that, I'll see if there's any uh, further questions. Uh, I don't see any yet. Does anyone have any questions? If you'd like to just uh, unmute your mic, you could ask or put it in the chat area. No, I don't see any. So I just want to thank you very much, Lisa, for a very informative presentation. It's really interesting. No, my pleasure. Happy to, here's my contact information. Happy to address any follow-up questions. And um, I recently wrote a short blog post um, on the iSchool uh, site. If you want to see it, um, there, there's the, the link to the blog. So thanks, everyone. Thank you. Okay.